Welcome, welcome everybody. It is a live recording of Airway Answers, expanding a breath of knowledge with our wonderful host, Nicole Goldfarb. Nicole has gathered three of the most amazing professionals in this field. Thank you so much, Nicole, for convincing them to come. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce everybody really quickly. Um, so you guys all know everybody that's, that's here, but Dr. Stanley Liu is an assistant or an associate professor of otolaryngology and by courtesy of plastic and reconstructive surgery at Stanford University School of Medicine. He is director of the Stanford Sleep Surgery Fellowship and a Stanford Biodesign Faculty Fellow alumnus. Dr. Surusagi is a highly specialized ENT, a sleep surgeon, and one of the founders of the Breathe Institute. He is also the functional cranioplasty master, as well as a dad to Maxim and husband to Dr. Nora. Dr. Yoon completed her orthodontic and pediatric dentistry residencies at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Dr. Yoon was invited to join UCLA School of Dentistry as a clinical faculty. She is also an adjunctive, adjunct assistant professor at Stanford Sleep Medicine Center at Stanford University an honorary assistant professor of orthodontics at the University of Hong Kong, an adjunct assistant professor in orthodontics at University of Pacific, and a clinical associate faculty at Tufts University School of Dental Medicine. She is also a co-director of pediatric dental sleep mini residency program at Tufts University. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to let our host take over and let's hear from you guys. Welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here because I know you all have the busiest schedules around and um, it took a while to get all three of you together and we're even missing one, but I'm sure he'll <laughs> pop in soon um, to get two of the three of you together. So um, we really appreciate you being here on a Friday night. Um, I did, I was thinking in my mind, you guys are the dream team and I've heard that before. And I said, let's call this the dream team reunion. But can you guys explain to me why you're called the dream team? Because there's a reason, right? Wasn't this a name you were given at Stanford? Hopefully I didn't make that up. <laughs> so maybe Dr. Zaghi or Dr. Yoon can just explain that. Yes, uh, absolutely. So first of all, <laughs> let me thank you guys for having this amazing Airway Circle group. Uh, the work that we do behind the scenes wouldn't have any value if it wasn't for you guys uh, right there in the clinics and communities. Uh, driving both the need and implementation of the work that we do. Um, I was so lucky to meet uh, Audrey through my uh, Stanford Sleep Surgery Fellowship. So personally, when I was in residency, we would do rounds, we would see patients. And at UCLA, they were so good at like facial plastic surgery, head neck cancer. They knew all the data, you know, what year this was, the protocol, how to stage head neck cancer surgery, all these great things. But then there's a patient with big tonsils and the chief of the department is like, uh, refer for a sleep study, send to sleep medicine. And I was so like, really? Like, is that the best that we have? So I looked up on and I saw, wow, Stanford. That's where I need to go. So I went, I visited, I got to meet Dr. Capasso, I got to meet Dr. Riley Powell, I got to meet Stanley Liu, who was just like a second year faculty. Stanley was like the resident or the, was a fellow at the time that I was applying. Uh, I got to meet Matt Camacho and I was like, wow, this is the place. This is the place that sleep apnea was invented. This is the place where UARS was invented, AHI. Sleep apnea surgery. Wow. Uh, so I went there and I was so, so incredibly impressed. And there was a few people that impressed me the most. And these few people were really the ones on the outliers. So Audrey can tell you better than anyone else that there's some faculty in the sleep medicine department that are still like, you know, trying to catch along, maybe have to come to an airway circle meeting, you know, here or there. But there was Three people who were on the fringes, right? Who were radicals, who were really out there talking about crazy things. One of them was our mentor to all of us, Dr. Christian Gimino. And I think Audrey uh, can tell you, Audrey was closer to him than anyone, all right? 
uh, you know, as close as I was to him and I had the mentorship, it was really through Audrey that I had any connection at all to uh, Dr. Gimino and that I got to uh, do research with him. Uh, and then we had Stanley and Audrey who were really kind of pushing the envelope in terms of the treatments they were able to provide. Uh, and Audrey, you were doing the orthodontics for some of our MMA cases. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Audrey would do the MMA cases and we got to meet her and I got to visit her clinic and learn so much. And then there's this moment that I would never forget, right? We're sitting there planning jaw surgery, okay? Like jaw surgery is like no joke, right? You have to like do like Lafort cuts, BSSO, like plate it, rearrange it. So we're standing there with Stanley and with, you know, Dr. Powell and Camacho and, you know, Carlos Torre. We're like planning what movements we're going to do. We're virtu- Guillaume, you know, comes and says, you guys are wasting your time. Like this is, this is all BS. This is too late. Okay. I have a very important thing to show you. Right. And if you guys know Stanley, what an ultimate professional. Right. I don't think there's any person who can say one bad thing about Stanley. He's in the room, by the way. Just professional. <laughs> What's that? He's in the room, by the way. He's going to. Oh, he's in here. Stanley? Him. He's here. Okay. Amazing. Um, and I hope you can hear me. I, I got so much. Stanley gave so much respect. He, the, the one thing Stanley doesn't have is time. And he gave his time, energy, focus uh, to this man who, you know, for all purposes, was saying some very bizarre things, some things that were really ahead of his time. And so Stanley and I, uh, you know, he he would book like frenuloplasty, tongue tie procedures uh, ahead of MMA cases. And so I will never forget, we had like three, four or five or six back plan back to back. And Stanley taught me how to do my first frenuloplasty, considering that I was a graduate of UCLA head neck surgery, that I had done facial reconstruction, but I was so fortunate uh, to practice her a few there. Uh, and then Audrey got involved with the research. When is it a tongue tie? When is it not a tongue tie? And then everything took us by storm. But I just want to welcome Stanley here. It's always such a pleasure to see you here, Stanley. <laughs> yes. Very, 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 very good. And it's so great for us all uh, to be here together. That is so great. So that is clearly why you guys are the dream team. And it's so amazing to like have that name for you all. Um, I wanted to thank you also. I know you all teach different courses and I was privileged to be able to take the Tufts Airway Mini Residency course four years ago with Dr. Liu and Dr. Yoon, which was amazing. It was the first time that course was being held. Um, and that was unbelievable. It was so great. And then I took took the first round of the Myo Masterminds course with Dr. Zaghi and the TBI group. And that was amazing also. And so we really want to thank you all for the knowledge that you spread to everyone in the community because you spreading this information to related professionals multiplies that times a thousand as we spread that to patients. So it's like your you're reaching us to so many across the world. And there's so many people across the world on this Zoom right now. There's people from all over. So Renata can tell us later, but that's just wonderful. And um, what I wanted to start out with is playing our little game. Renata, does that sound good to you? That does. Are you guys ready? So I'm going to explain again really quickly how we're going to do this game. So the faster one to answer wins, okay? We're just, you know, that game that's called, I think, first word frenzy. You're going to say a word. I'm going to say a word or and Nicole's going to say a word. And the first person who says something related to that word gets a point. Okay. Whoever wins, you guys can pick a charity and Airway Circle is going to donate $100 to the charity. Deal? So you three need to have your mics on. <laughs> I hope your internet works. That's so um you got to be fast. That's the whole point is just word association. We're going to say a word. You say a word really fast. First word comes to your mind, but the first person to respond. So is uh, this Dr. Lou's microphone? We're good. Hello, Dr. Lou. I just awesome. saw them. So for example. What's up, team? Hello. There we good. go. <laughs> All right. So if I say the word tooth, for example, you might say ache or deviated or even might say septum. Okay. But <laughs> Yes, if you Wait, say, so just the first person who says anything. <laughs> yeah, yes, anything, but it has to be that word. <laughs> Whatever comes to your mind when you hear that word, it might be really bizarre. 
But that's okay. Cause we're, I we're guarantee different. you it would be really bizarre. <laughs> Especially on a Friday night. <laughs> Especially after right. a Friday crazy clinic. And these yeah. guys know. They know, they know mm -hmm. the mood I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Grab that glass that come out of my mouth right now. Anything. Just about anything. We should all right. have our martinis right Keep now. it PG. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Here all we right, go. Ready? Yeah, I'll do the first word. All right, guys. Ready, be fast. Sleep. Happy. Surgery. Ready. Wait, we got it. <laughs> yeah, all of us. It's a tie. <laughs> it has to be the first one. It has to be the first one. Second word, tongue. Tie. There you go. Good job. All right. Did you say surgery for the first one too, Audrey? Did you say surgery? Yeah, what did you say? Surgery. Surgery. Uh, we're on the same page. We're mentally, we we're right there. Totally yeah, what were your answers? What were you going to say? Sleep what? He said apnea. He said apnea. Oh. Apnea. Wow. And he peed wow. you all. He wow. peed wow. you too. So. Really taking a step back. I like that. And what about tongue? What did you say for tongue, Stanley? I, I have no words. Uh, no <laughs> words for the tongue. No words. He's overwhelmed. <laughs> He's super overwhelmed by tongue. the tongue. <laughs> okay. Here's the next one. Mayo. Functional. <laughs> there you go. Double point for that. Tied. All, all right. Tied. Word number four. Sarush. Awesome. Ah. <laughs> All right. Um, I want you to skip this one. Actually, this I will. one is a bonus word. Do you want me to do it? Yeah. Number five, Stay you Stanley. can do Ask, it. But whoever answers Stanley, I want to tell you. I want you to answer. It gets three extra okay. points. Go ahead. There is a right answer. If you answer the correct answer, you get two points for this one. Okay. Three. My, my mistake. Three. You can say it, Renata. Word number five. Airway. Oh, cool. Circle. 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 Dr. Yoon got that first. Good. Hey, come on. Got it first. <laughs> okay, here's the next one. Ready? Palette. Hi, Arch. Good job. Oh, oh my she goodness. Is way oh, faster goodness. than the two guys here. Okay. Go Number ahead. seven. Nasal. Septum. Oh my gosh. You guys are good. so slow. <laughs> He's on fire. Okay. Number eight. Stanley. The man. <laughs> and the man. Right. If you say stand, that's it. Upper. Airway resistance. Yes, that's what I wanted. Okay, there you go. Good. That was on my mind. Okay, here's the next one. Cone. Game city. <laughs> Eleven. Tonsil. Adenoid. <laughs> yes. Number 12, Audrey. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think there's a delay for sailing. <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll catch up. I'll catch up. It was a long time. I was going to say legend, but, but, but I'll catch up. <laughs> oh, that was good. Number 13, jaw. Surgery. <laughs> Well, we are very. <laughs> Just add the word surgery to everything. Palate surgery, nasal <laughs> surgery, tongue tie surgery. That's true. Lady surgery. Okay, number 14, mandibular. Advancement. Advancement. <laughs> oh, that was was first, but good. Okay, almost done with the dome. Surgery. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> okay, surgery is no longer allowed. <laughs> dome. Okay, no. oh. Breathing. Breathing. Good, good answer. Major breathing. Okay, number 16, functional. Spanuloplasty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 17, airflow. Restriction. There you go. Great. Okay, number 18, tethered. Huh? Uh, next right. one, pediatric. Airway. <laughs> All right, the last one, mini. Doom. Okay. <laughs> say. Um, Audrey just screamed you both. <laughs> you killed it. She's got 12. Audrey. She's All right, we have do, you have, do you have a charity already that you like or you want to send it to me later? Okay, I will send you to you later. Awesome. I'll let you guys know who it is. Thank you guys for playing this game. That was great. <laughs> okay, now everyone's warmed up. I think Dr. Lou's warmed up now. All right. So. <laughs>
<laughs> Here we go. So um, let's go over some some questions. So of course, we talked a little bit about Dr. Gimeno, and I want to know more about him and his influence on you and maybe any specific experiences you had with him. Well, yeah, I mean, he influenced me in every single aspect of sleep. Uh, now, now he's in heaven and I miss him so much, but he was my inspiration. Um, I mean, past years, his passion was to look for preventive treatment for sleep apnea. So he has been pressure me to come up with a growth modification protocol for children. Um, and he's the one who introduced my functional therapy to me. He also asked me to look for frenulum research and connect the missing puzzle with the sleep apnea with the frenulum. And he had many brilliant ideas that he encouraged me to find more reliable way to grow maxilla. And that's how we designed the dome. Uh, with Dr. Liu and it's still evolving, but uh, I mean, the, everything about the sleep, he was the, my inspiration and he was always uh, my cheerleader. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, either do you guys, Dr. Zagi or Dr. Liu? I, I want to hear from, from, from Stanley because really uh, the, the impression that Guillaume, you know, made on me uh, was really through uh, both Audrey and Stanley and especially uh, Stanley's humility and highest degrees of respect for this man that um, one thing that really bothered me when I was there as a, as a fellow was, was that, that he wasn't getting the respect that he, that, that he deserved. Uh, and Stanley went above and beyond to uh, reciprocate and make up for all of the, the um, you know, the, the lack of appreciation that, that I personally observed there. So Stanley, can, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Serge. By the way, but Serge, you, you, you were the first fellow where we had that wonderful group photo with uh, CG, uh, you know, in, in the sleep medicine clinic. And um, so a couple of things, you know, for CG, um, just like myself, um, if you want to get him to to kind of hang out with you, talk with you, get get some get get some booze uh, going in the office and a lot of things uh, happen that way. I mean, I still remember Audrey, you remember that Friday afternoon. In our clinic, uh, you know, uh, a few. Yeah, there you go. Who found that picture? Beautiful. <laughs> um, and and uh, you know, a couple of glasses of wine or whatnot, and and it's a lot better. Um, I will say this. I you know when when CG passed away, and 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 um, uh, you know he 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 really didn't. I guess have a chance to kind of designate where a lot of his life's work would go to and i mean that by you know binders and folders that he kept um one of the things that uh uh because they were like guys if you uh, whatever it is you want to take from the office you, you need to take us um tonight you know our custodians will will throw out everything and it's really kind of sad because it's like there is a an encyclopedia not not only of a great man's mind uh, but a vision that we still carry on. So I'm like, okay. So I finished clinic just like today. I'm like, okay, well, okay, go check it out. I, I, I brought a few binders and to this day, I will not forget. One of the binders had everything about narrow high arch palate, maxillary expansion. Now, mind you, this is from the 1970s. So all of that stuff was like orthodontics, you know, the monkeys with the, the, the nose plugged and all. But it, it goes to show you that he was already thinking about this in 1970, 1980. And it took 50 years, maybe 40 years, for it to come to fruition. And, and I think, you know, if he knew that, uh, you know, one day, uh, you know, uh, via channels like the Airway Circle and the champions and, and all the members who are champions of this field to carry this forward, I just want you to know that it it was already in his mind and people were thinking about moving a bunch of teeth around, which is not very exciting to be frank, but he was already thinking about, wait a minute, that is actually affecting the airway. So, so I still think, I mean, that it, it's such a long lasting legacy. I mean, yes, we've had a lot of great, you know, wine and cheese with the guy, but seeing where his mind was in 1970, that was amazing. And, 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 you know, I will say this though, uh, I saw in a lot of those correspondences were like PhD research from Denmark or some unpublished work from somewhere. And they sent it to him because he understood. So 
you know, when I think about uh, Airway Circle and, and this network, there, there are things that you observe uh, in the grassroots and there, there are things that you do. And, and, and don't, don't be shy to share it with us because we, we also can be your biggest champions as well. I think the biggest problem was he had that binder sit there for 40 years. Uh, and maybe today, uh, the observations that you find um, and he, when you share it with us, we should not wait 40 years before we make a change uh, in our field. So that's, that's probably uh, you know, the biggest impact. Um, kind of, you know, digging through the minds of, of, of a great man. Yeah, and it really kind of shows that you said people didn't really listen to him maybe or didn't agree with him, but he carried on and you were carrying on his legacy. And, you know, thank you for really spreading that message because sometimes it takes that that person who just continues with their beliefs, even though they're not being heard by the community. And you just said 40 years ago, 1970s, he was saying things that are right now. We're like, oh, proving this now. And he knew that. So, you know, a lesson for everyone when you're seeing things maybe clinically, even maybe if there's not research yet to back it or whatever, just continue to investigate um, and spread that message and stand firm in what you, what you're noticing, you know, with patients. And so you guys really did carry that on for him and we all appreciate that a lot and it's it's great to take a moment to really uh, I, recognize and, mm -hmm. and Nicole I should make a note though in all those papers I read through nothing mm -hmm. talked about the frenulum so you can imagine you can mm -hmm. imagine when this became an, an additional piece uh, to it you know um, what excitement uh, that must have engendered you know uh, I'll tell you because um, you know the first uh, orthodontist that uh, uh, he, CG, encountered uh, to talk about maxillary expansion in kids uh, was is a good friend of Audrey, right, uh, uh, Dr. Pirelli from Italy. But he, 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 you know, she told me, you know, it was in Finland uh, in the 80s uh, or 90s when they had this meeting. And when she talked about maxillary expansion, he leapt out of his chair and he says, that's the, that's the thing. And I bet you when, when, when you know, frenoplasty and, and tongue mobility and everything else was brought to his attention, how, how, how excited uh, that, that must have been uh, for him. So, um, again, just, just to echo the fact yeah. that, I don't know, I, I feel like a part of us are following history, but a part of you guys, not me, but like, like the, the, the Sarushas of the world is, is creating uh, that, that history. Um, so, so very, very, very cool stuff. Yeah, and and I and I think there's a, there's a lot to learn from from his struggles uh, as well because there's a lot of us here in the room who are like, well, we're not we're not a medical doctor, right? Uh, we're we're not a we're not a surgeon. We're not uh, those those people. Do we really have a seat at this table? So I just want to run a pop quiz for everyone here in the audience. Pop quiz: What was Doctor Gumino's specialty before sleep medicine? What specialty was he? Was he a surgeon? Was he an ICU doctor? Was he a cardiologist? Do you guys know? Let's see. Anybody? I'll check Facebook also. Who's the first one? Psychiatry. It was a psychiatrist. Think about that. He was a psychiatrist discovering sleep apnea. Right? Well, he might argue he was a neurologist. But neurologist? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> But if you consider, just like all of us here, he didn't learn about, you know, sleep apnea through psychiatrists and maybe neurologists. I mean, they studied the brain, but then he really worked with cardiologists at first to discover the impact of uh, sleep on, uh, you know, uh, high blood pressure and stroke and other issues. And then he took it on to talk to uh, oral surgeons in the form of Riley and Powell, ENT doctors and OMFS doctors. And he had it in him to listen to myofunctional therapists and, and speech therapists about all these uh, amazing issues. So I think uh, the one thing that we have to take away is that, that he was a psychiatrist neurologist, right? Psychiatrist neurologist who's teaching us ENTs about breathing. <laughs> I, I remember one day, uh, Dr. Christian Gennarino. It's the appropriate way to breathe, through the mouth or through the nose. 
<laughs> I but remember. God, it's, a, it's a simple question, right? Yeah. But it was only in 2014 yeah. that Dr. Guillaume, you know, published his paper that said, you know, we have to get our kids breathing through the nose. And that was around the time that I was in fellowship and this paper was just coming out. And this was a very revolutionary idea that it's not just about sleep apnea. It's really about mouth versus nasal breathing. Um, and so we take these things for granted and it was just like eight years ago. So we have to kind of uh, recognize that the way that we're going to learn is from each other, different specialties. And that's why we have, you know, I learned so much from Audrey as a pedodontist, orthodontist. I learned so much from Stanley uh, as an oral maxillofacial surgeon and ENT doctor. And, uh, you know, he has so many other credentials, including uh, innovator and inventor. And um, we just got to keep learning from different disciplines, you know? Yeah, I, I, I want to talk about that the episode. So one day he was very into the frenulum, but he doesn't know how to prove. So I remember I was uh, you know, was a clinic with uh, the Stanley and then he was actually knocked the door and Audrey, come out, come out. And then he actually showed me the little piece of the uh, paper, um, pa towel, little paper towel, and he wrote frenulum. And then he just gave it to me and said, Audrey, you do the research about frenulum. So I asked him, so what kind of research? And he said, you just find out, you just do the frenulum. And I, it was a few weeks that I don't know what to do. And then I think I met uh, Soroshi on the, on the aisle at the Stanford, or, you know, on the way to the, uh, to the break room. And that time, the Soroshi, you actually had a little grading about the turbinate, right? Like you had a grading skills, like the turbinate one, two, three. And then I was like asking the Soroshi that, um, Dr. Ginemino want me to do some frenulum research and I have zero idea. We have to start from very, very, uh, you know, ground that we have to, from very basic, we have to see even what is, how to even um, analyze and grading. And then Soros says, oh, I can make it grading. You start, Audrey, you go in the measure. Uh, I know how to grade. And I, that's how we studied for our first paper, the frenulum yeah. paper with the Soros. I remember it was just, like I met you on the on the aisle at the Stanford. I, I remember, I remember, because because I had just worked with Mac on uh, grading on turbinates. Turbinates. So yeah. we were doing a uh, so. Uh, uh oh. So uh -oh. he he had a grading system with a little bell curve, and then you go like top ten percentile, top twenty five percentile, and then he was making the grading system. So. Uh, so she said, Audrey, you go and then get the measurement. I'll figure out. And then <laughs> that's how we started our first two friend on paper. Yeah. And how long do you guys think it took Audrey to collect a thousand data points? How long would it take you guys to collect a thousand data points on patients? It probably took her a week. <laughs> a week? A week is a little. It would take like, like years, right? Yeah. Like a thousand patients, right? She knocked it out in three months. No wow. way. Three months, Crazy. triple checked. And the data was triple checked too. It was unbelievable. Three wow. months. That She's is. like, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Boom, this boom, boom, so, boom, 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 boom. This is I so mean, fun. tongue range of motion on yeah. a thousand patients. Has That's anyone so here tongue range of motion to a thousand patients? Oh my goodness, right? This is so fun to hear where these ideas were born from and frenulum on a paper towel. And now it's like, you know, so amazing. Um, what would you all consider your biggest accomplishment since finishing your fellowship at Stanford? I think the most exciting thing for me to see uh, the change of our residency program curriculum. Uh, I'm really trying to move our mainstream uh, people scholars to to open this uh, new idea. And uh, during COVID, I was able to establish the dental sleep medicine courses, which is like all year joint courses between uh, UOP and UCLA, uh, UCSF. One good thing about COVID, we are so used to the Zoom. So I have to go to three different uh, universities to give a talk. Now I can make a whole year courses. And now it's a part of our residency curriculum. 
I think this is a big that uh, at least in California or the orthodontists who especially graduating um, um, past five years is a recent grad. They are um, they are very well equipped um, and very well trained. Uh, at least they are they know that what is the airway orthodontist. And uh, I'm also very excited to actually announce that uh, we established the World Dental Facial Sleep Society um, literally last month. Yay! <laughs> so yeah, I, I cannot wait to share the real news. But it's as a dental medicine society, currently we have only AADSM, which is American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, which focuses on uh, mainly oral appliance and is only in U.S., uh, but there is a huge need for global uh, international society and uh, our WDSS uh, provide the sleep medicine education, um, not just limited to oral appliance, but our topic emphasize gross modifications, multidisciplinary treatment modality, including myofunctional therapy and sleep surgery. So uh, our first meeting will be next year and now. Uh, a lot of other country, we already talked to 17 countries, uh, Dental Sleep Society, and they are, I mean, nobody rejected. So they all wanna be part of it. And uh, we really wanna educate globally um, and not just, again, it's not just oral plans. We really wanna teach the, the whole uh, field of the dental sleep medicine. Wow, it's much needed. Thank you so much. And you're the perfect one to lead that, so. Whatever you need from us, just let us know. <laughs> oh, um, so, so once the uh, the registration is open, I think sometime next week. Awesome. Send me the link and then I'll post on every circle. That would be great. I do have a question in the chat box from Dr. Matthew Rao, who I love. Thank you for being here, Dr. Rao. He says, speaking of observations, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, is anyone else noticing that within families, when an older sibling is diagnosed with ties, each subse subsequent sibling tends to be more visually and functionally restricted? Gene depletion throughout a fam familial line? Oh, it definitely is a genetic. Tongue tie is a genetic. And, uh, um, but do you think, do you think the, the, when you have children, uh, the younger ones are more tongue-tied than the right. older one. Do, do you see that? I'm not sure. It's interesting. So he's saying that the, the subsequent siblings are more severely tongue-tied. That's interesting, huh? I noticed that with my patients. That that the younger ones are even more tongue-tied mm -hmm. than the older ones? Mm -hmm. People are commenting. They notice that too. Wow. And do you think it's it's a, it's a sequential birth or or just nowadays, like, the, the birth, the inc it's, there's an increasing rate. It's an inter interesting observation. So I, I feel like there's so much, you know, who knows what's preventing that apopto apoptosis from happening. And plus, I feel like more and more children are being born earlier and earlier. You know, before they would just wait. I mean, in Brazil, 90% of births are C-section, uh, planned C-sections. Um, so I know that children are being born earlier and earlier. So maybe, you know, we're not giving them enough time. I mean, diet has changed tremendously. Who knows what else? Does anybody want to guess what else could be affecting this or causing this if it's really happening? Even in my own children, somebody said. And then parents want to be checked. And then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe more to gestational issues. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's something to do with um, how we all are carrying these babies and, I mean, the stuff that they are spreading. But I'll tell you, that it's, it's these observations that, that you guys share with us that stimulates, you know, Audrey and I and Stanley, like, afterwards to get on the phone and be like, like, Audrey, like, like, like what do you think? Like, is it worth doing a study on that? Like, should we look into it? Um, and just to give you a little bit of our thought process when we're, like, you know, like if I was to get on, was on the phone with Audrey and say, hey, like, should we look into that? Doing a study like that wouldn't be very difficult because you enroll families and you kind of poll and you can kind of take a look at that very uh, sequentially and you can statistically gear it to see, you know, whether or not that hypothesis is true. So doing such a study like that is very feasible if you have, a, you know, a list of patients. But then the question becomes is, is uh, you know, what would you do with that data and, um, you know, what implications does that have? Um, 
It's a great you know? question. Yeah. So what, what, what are your thoughts on a project like that, RJ and Stanley? Let's just do like a live uh, analysis because because we all have limited time, right? So if we're going to do a project, for example, you said like, what's a meaningful project that we brought to fruition? And I was going to say the Ferris Six. Uh, and the Ferris Six is something that, you know, was was stemmed from, you know, Cynthia Peterson and the AMS and the APMD. And really, uh, we had Dr. Guillemino really pushing for a new way of screening for pediatric sleep disorders. So now that we have the Ferris Six, we can kind of implement that in schools and, uh, you know, behavioral psychologists and uh, pediatricians and dental offices. So really the research that we want to do, we want to, uh, we want for it to have like a purpose. Someone else, you know, kind of reached out to me like, oh, do a systematic review on tongue ties and speech. But really, you know, if you need a systematic review to, to learn that tongue tie affects speech, um, you know, that's like, that's in the past, right? Well, we're trying to like work on the future, give tools to the individuals here in this audience. So um, uh, I, I think it's interesting, but what, what, what do you guys think, uh, Audrey and Stanley, about that? that idea and, you know, testing it with the research project. I mean, maybe I will start looking at um, mm -hmm. my uh, clinical observation as well. Uh, okay. And then see, you know. This yeah, let's, let's start all looking. Let's start looking at that. Yeah. And, um, and Audrey, I'm excited for the lip data that you have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's do some life involved. into that project. Who yeah. here thinks that we need more research on lip ties? You guys, want, so you guys get a vote. Should we do research on grading lip ties as they change with time, or should we see, you know, first child, second child who has the bigger tongue tie? Because oh. we have limited time, so that and that's how and that's how these things work, right? Mm -hmm. The lip. So time. should we do lip ties, or should we do yeah. lip, lip ties? Lip ties, yeah. So you yeah, guys see where research really priorities do. are, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right, Audrey. Okay. So, so if, I, if, I, if I can give a recommendation, um, yeah, I think increasingly, even in academia, we have um, a focus on real life, real world data, which is what you guys have. So um, I think instead of, um, and I've I've been trying to bug, and to be honest, I've been trying to bug you know Renata for this for a long, long time, which is there's so much real life, uh, real world data that we can gather from this community. So, um, you know, with the research question that, that we're tackling, right, it's not ridiculously difficult to take your iPhone and take a picture of that tie. And it's not ridiculously difficult to take that tie and take a picture of the siblings with that tie. The key then is how can we gather real world data and make it more powerful than any systematic review because i think to be honest i think the world is also probably tired of seeing our research work coming out of us um, because ultimately it's coming out everywhere and it's it's ground truth so if we are able to uh, provide the tools let's say a very standardized tool of uh, these pictures of tongue ties and of families um, and that we are able to really put this data together, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 people with machine learning, artificial intelligence analysis. Um, I, I just think that impact would be huge and we're ready to do it. So I, I, I still think that if, 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 if we can come up with a simple protocol, very simple, how would you standardize taking the pictures? How would you standardize the way this data is sent? And then you do analysis on this. This is so powerful, you can't even argue against it. And then what's going to come after that is you create an app that allows every parent to take a picture of this and say, well, shoot, I am really well off the bell curve and I need to be uh, assessed. But how, do you, how, how, how are you assessed? Oh, simple. On this app, you would have the, the experienced practitioners uh, on this network to say, okay, uh, near me in Atlanta, near me in San Diego, near me in wherever, uh, that we can look at it. So I, I really want to go big. I think we can go very big. If everybody has a standardized way of taking a photo, having it sent to a place, machine learning analysis, pre and post plastic surgery, pre and post symptoms, 
um, this is where this is going. Now, you people worry about, you know, consents, no problem, because you're consented via an online portal where uh, you, uh, uh, you know, uh, allow the consent. And so all of us actually can study this. So like you, me, Audrey, anybody, actually everybody in this room can study this data. You say, I'm going to study this. You have no idea who the patients are. That's okay. That's not the point. Um, and then you really make that impact. So um, I, I, I want to kind of pull the, you know, I, it's funny, right? Because I'm, it's almost hypocritical. I am the guy in the ivory tower and I'm saying we get out of the ivory tower. And, and, and that's exactly where this has to go. Real world data and uh, sent in and uh, uh, having everybody having uh, the ability to, to analyze that and the patients consenting to that. And, and what can we give back to them? Well, we can try to write papers, but Sarush, you and I know this, right? Papers are reviewed by editors and reviewed by the reviewers who half of them hate me anyway. Uh, they don't hate you, but they have them hate me. Um, and then truth never comes out. CG went through this a long, long, long time. So, uh, but but we can give the, the, the people who provide us the data, our myofunctional therapists, our dentists, our surgeons, and say, hey, you know how guys, when it's this restricted at age eight, if you don't do anything, it's not good. And so we, we'll, we'll, we'll give that back because, you know, data is not information. And that's another piece of thing. You know, I know people are like, oh, it's Stanley talking about some collecting some wearable BS. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. Data is not information. Data properly analyzed and digested and shared is information. And then we do it. And we start from the grassroots, infinitely more powerful than the stupid Stanfords of the world and wherever the hell those guys are doing. You know what I mean? Um, so uh, let's think about that. And I've been bugging this network for that. You know, simple picture. Everybody in the family, including the parents, whatever you think is valuable to analyze tongue movement, videos can work too. Machine learning, artificial intelligence analysis, we can learn more uh, beyond what we already know. Um, so, so let's think about real world data, uh, and, 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 and really leveraging this network. We're getting tons of messages on Facebook with people saying, yes, let's work together to help anything we can do to further research. I love this idea. Sign me up to help. So I think everybody is in. Mm -hmm. or very yeah. because because you know Sarush and Audrey is not like that because we try to learn something and we try to share with the world but so many uh, practitioners are in the realm of um, they may have discovered something that works but then they say well then you know only we do what we do yeah. uh, no because um, we will wipe you out this is a different era right this is a different era and 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 so um yeah help us um yeah. again uh a simple photo uh before uh sort of uh, or some of the um assessments you guys do uh with a simple questionnaire about nasal breathing it's so powerful it's ridiculous it, it, it's ridiculous the kids telling you you can't breathe and the kids tongue tied or whatever it is it's so powerful you, you just gotta put it together and then when you have like 20,000 people, it, it's kind of baffling. So, uh, but I, I think it's doable. So let's please do it. Because if you don't do it, we can operate until the cows come home. And then we really haven't really contributed very, very much uh, to, to, to society as a whole. I, I have to say that my number one inspiration for research and things like that is hearing Stanley speak. When Stanley says something like that, I take it as a charge and I take it as a mission, right? To like, <laughs> let's make that happen. Let's make that happen. Um, and to, to that extent, uh, in making it happen, I wanna let you know about some opportunities that we're working on as a community that are in the works, okay? And one of these is uh, it's called The Outlook and it's gonna be presented at AAPMD this year. It's a project we've been working on for three or four years. One of the biggest problems with collecting group data is actually aggregating that data. We tried to do this through the, I think it was the AMS. Uh, a while ago, we got 650 data points, but they came in from all over. And some of the data 
didn't match the others. So the way that some people were grading and scoring was very different from others. For example, in terms of maxillary width and indicator line, and it really threw everything off. And even simple things as to rate whether or not someone is a nasal breather or out breather. Some people scored nasal breathing as the best number one. Some people scored it as a four and it really ruined our data, okay? So the data has to be collected in a very standardized way. And so we've come up actually with a software, it's called the Outlook software, that's gonna be featured at the APMD uh, this year in September. It's already IRB approved multidisciplinary, and it's very simple. It's just called mouth taping for 30 minutes. All you have to do for the intervention is tape your mouth for 30 minutes and rate a pre and post questionnaire. Uh, we will be gathering data on this, the actual uh, you know, breathing physiology, we're working with Rosalba, Courtney, and others. Uh, but more than that, we're working on the systems behind data collection. That's really what we're testing. Can we get data from multiple sources to compile in a systematic fashion? The next step would be to do things that are subjective, like rating pictures and photos. That would be an additional layer that would be built into this software. And then an additional layer would be the uh, you know, machine learning. Because you guys know, grading, grading tongue ties of the tongue tie not highly subjective. Can you breathe through your nose? How long? Timer, your mouth tape, not subjective, very objective. You can either breathe or you can't breathe. So that's what we're doing. It's going to be featured at the APMD this year. Whoever wants to sign up and participate, there may be many here who are part of that IRB. Uh, and we encourage you guys to come and get involved on the system behind data collection that Stanley's talking about so that in the future we can do these studies on, you know, tongue and lip ties and so on. You already thought about this, huh? <laughs> uh, you, we've been talking about it for a while, yeah. So we've been we've been talking about it. We're 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 in the works of it uh, for some time. So we actually have the software now, uh, and we have it's a it's a it's a portal. It's called Outlooks.iao. It works on mobile and online. Uh, we've had a computer engineer working on it for the past three years. So it's it's these things are very complex to get them to work systematically across different sites. And again, uh. It's, uh just the process of data collecting from multiple people in a systematic fashion, that needs to be tested before we actually collect the actual data. So we wouldn't want to, you know, spend too much time, uh, you know, having you guys rate and grade all these things if it just goes in an email box somewhere where, you know, if it's too much, 3,000, how is someone going to, like, the actual collecting and the merging of the data is, is, is you know, infinitely achievable if we have it the right way. Great. This is all great, like modern, you know, new way of thinking, which is what we all need. So we can reach people across the world and um, gather so much data and information. So that sounds great at the APMG to be able to um, have that, that, brief, that it's called Outlook. Is that what it's called? It's called Outlook. Yeah. Outlook. Okay. Yeah. Cause we all know too, um, the sort of debate with the lip taping and we want to be confident in which patients we're using that with and feel confident in our um, ability and have research backing that it's okay in certain situations. Um, I want to change it around a little bit with a couple of questions here. Um, so we've all had thoughts, you know, in our career that we are proven wrong or we realized, oh, wow, my thinking was actually not correct. I'm wondering if you have all had that experience where there was something you thought was true, you believed to be true, and you later learned it was not correct with regards to, you know, sleep, airway, you know, maybe a patient case, something that turned around your way of thinking. If you can think of something. <laughs> yeah, I, I genuinely thought when I first started that tongue tie was the answer to everything. OK, like, I, I don't know, like how I came to think that, but I had like one, two, three, four, five, 50 patients, like all airway issues. I would clip their tongue tie and they would like rave and rant. And so for my next like 250, you know, 300, like I was confident going in there, releasing these tongue ties. And I genuinely believed I was curing their sleep apnea. Right. Uh, it, 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 it was a little bit hard to actually gather that data and to realize that sometimes, yes, Mostly no, mostly no, okay? And it's only yes when you have the three things, the tongue tie, the tongue tone, and the tongue space. Uh, and so more recently, I'm really focused on the space issue that, that Audrey and Stanley are really um, the leaders in uh, addressing. 
and just really being humble and that tongue tie is so important, but it's only, it's only one piece of the puzzle. Praise you for saying that too, because that's actually amazing. Because you're the father of tongue tie and functional frenuloplasty, and it's so beautiful to hear that you recognize that it's not everything. Because I think a lot of us get so caught up in tongue tie because you know we we hear the information, and it really is important to know that there are so many other factors, and that might be one component or one piece of the puzzle. But that's not where we should rest all of our um, efforts in with our patients. Cause it's almost like for, as a myofunctional therapist, it feels like nearly every patient I see has a tongue tie. And I have to remember that like I have skewed caseload or I have a skewed um, perspective. Cause that's why, you know, it's related to the myofunctional issue, but you always start thinking like, am I overdiagnosing this? Am I overdoing this? But we must pay attention to all the other factors. Cause I, I believe in your research, it was only like 7% of the issue was the tongue tie only 7%, right? There's other factors to pay attention to. It, it's so. the, the chewing. I, I think I thought, then I thought swallowing, right? Mm -hmm. But now it's, it's chewing and chewing in the back that it's the bilateral symmetric chewing. When you only chew on one side, let's say you have a tooth pulled mm -hmm. and you're only chewing on one side. Okay. Without a tongue tie, without any other issues, that's a really disastrous situation that throws the whole system off. Um, and early on, if you're talking about chewing, you're talking, you're talking about the diet that we're feeding our kids. If you're on vacation, you go to a museum, <clears throat> you go to Disneyland, you know, Knott's Berry farm, wherever it is, and you're trying to buy a kid's kid's meal or kids, you know, kid's menu. What are you, what are you buying? You're buying soft processed foods, right? And I have a two-year-old, if there's fries on the table, it's over, it's over. You can't even like, Go to a cafeteria and let them see that, right? Yep. How, how do you prevent them from gravitating to these soft, processed, real junk foods when we're, when we're out, uh, you know, celebrating and spending time with our families? So uh, diet, nutrition, chewing, swallowing habits is really everything. Since yep, you mentioned like chewing, I'm going to tell you guys something that I learned from a, a recent course I took from Brazil. Um, they say that even um, bilateral simultaneous chewing is not that bad. Well, we have to pay attention. And a lot of people chew more on one side. We all know that. But what we have to pay attention is the first three to five bites. That's where the key is. If the first three to five bites are always on the right side, that's where we're going to see more issues. So I always tell my patients, if I can tell that they're, you know, low tone on this side, that it, you know, muscles are working better on this side, Okay, first three to five bites, start doing it on the other side. Eventually, they have to be able to always start, you know, going from side to side in order to be symmetrical and to keep balance. Wherever you're chewing your food after that, it doesn't really matter because the, the strength that you're doing, those first few bites, that's what's really going to get um, your muscles working out. So I thought that was a quick. That's interesting. Very interesting. Um, what about you, Dr. Yoon or Dr. Liu? Any, um, any things you came to realization that, oh, that's not actually correct? Uh, I mean, every day. I, my, my protocol change every day. So maybe for the, we are talking about expansions. In the beginning, I don't know how much I need to expand. So the more, the better. Just to, just to uh, uh, expand the maximum um, and then I learned some, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there there is a side effect and there is a physiologic limitations. And also, um, everybody has a different um, different anatomy, different physiology. Um, so I mean, our future has to be really like we we have to study for each patient's phenotypes, um, not just anatomy, but also they are looking at their genetics. Uh, they are looking at their physiology, what the patient wants, and also what the, actually the patient just need. Some patient may not need like twelve millimeter expansion. They, all they need is just you know, just to, you know, three millimeter enough that the nasal flow air just go through and then just relieve the the you know the the collapsibility changes. So um, we are now trying to do more personalized protocol. Um, we want to be more uh, focused on the patient base, like a patient centers, um, and the different in you know, a different protocol. There is no such a thing that like 
you know, exactly like expansion. Everybody expanding, you expect their sleep gonna be better. Or everybody, you do tongue tie surgery and they're all of a sudden they're gonna be better. It's, uh, everybody is so different. Uh, sleep apnea is very multifactorial and very uh, heterogenic. Uh, very heterogenic. So um, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'm still changing my protocol. I mean, like Nicole, you took my course four years ago. Now it's very different. <laughs> and a lot of information. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, new protocol guidelines. We learn, we change and modify it. But that's how we advance our field. And let's that's not forget you. that not every tie has to be released. Even though you know, a lot of our patients are tied. That doesn't mean that they have to be released. There's so much more that we can do. Like Dr. Zagi was saying, we can, you know, work on tongue space, send them to ortho, um, myofunctional therapy. And a lot of times your symptoms, you know, are relieved. They are happy with the, the improvements that they get. So you always have to go case by case, really look at, you know, every patient, their chief complaint and make your decision based on that what brazilian course did i take all my brazilian courses are in portuguese <laughs> um there's many of them I, I i it got to the point now that all i do is just brazilian courses i barely ever take any courses here not because i don't think i have anything to learn here just because the dollar exchange is <laughs> insane <laughs> Uh, and it's just so much cheaper for me to take courses from over there and i i enjoy it i you know the research and everything that they bring that's slightly different than than you know what we were being taught over here but um I'm, i'll i'll bring some stuff over to you guys soon no, no but renata uh, one thing you don't uh you you you're modest in, in in talking about this but but um don't forget uh, uh brazil is one of the most advanced uh areas in, in all aspects of sleep medicine of course uh brazil was cg's first love just so you know, so so the world's largest sleep lab to this day is in Sao Paulo. That's you know, awesome. Asia and Taiwan became his second love, but you know, people switch their, you know, whatever. But <laughs> Brazil was his first love. And so what happens is you have amazing surgeons. You know, there are no, there's so many ENT surgeons do skeletal surgery in Brazil. Uh, your myofunctional <clears throat> therapists are so strong in Brazil. Um, and, uh, every one of my visitors, uh, I actually have had a few from Brazil recently. Um, and as you know, I used to go to the end of the year and, um, they all have the widest jaws and the most beautiful smiles that planet earth uh, can find. So, uh, you know, you're, you're learning so from lucky. the, <laughs> you're learning from the, from the best place. But, um, one thing I did want to, I have no idea what I was going to talk about anymore. What are you guys but, talking about? Oh, but I am I about? am bringing stuff to you guys, know. so just hang in there. As hang in, no, no, we're hanging, we're hanging. Yeah. <laughs> As you're thinking about what you're gonna say, I want you guys to put in the chat box. I'm bringing Brazilian speakers to the courses. Do yeah. you guys yeah. mind reading it? Because a lot of them, the really good ones, a lot of them do not speak English. So do you guys mind having caption? You can tell me what you'd rather. So a translator talking over them or caption. Well, tell me what you'd like better. Go ahead, Dr. Stanley. No, and I appreciate it. And I can tell you, they, they are amazing at what they do. So even the, um, you know, Saroosh, you have a horrific uh, competitor who I don't even think is your equal in LA. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, he uh, says that uh, the, he only trusts a Brazilian myofunctional therapist. <laughs> <laughs> You know who he is. I mean, the guy who can't operate for two cents. And that will, will not continue. I did not name any names. All right. I'm, I'm just getting warmed up. So I'm glad this is over in 20 minutes. So uh, two thoughts I have. Um, one thought is, what were we talking about earlier? Oh, uh, something you thought was true. Yeah. And then okay. What, bits, what business are we in? Because for the longest time, the, the, the pure fragmentation of the field and everybody doing great work and the fact that none of us really can seem to kind of, you know, coalesce into a, a uniform um, thing. And so, uh, you know, again, on my, my website, and it's so hard to get a website at Stanford, but I mean, it's a very young website. It's two, two, two months in the making, but I've been saying this the longest time. Restoring airway health uh, in sleep yeah, is the gateway to wellness. That that is the common gold. Uh, 
So I don't even care if it is our maxillary expansion, uh, you know, advancement surgery, tonsil preserving, pharyngoplasty, nasal surgery, everything we do. In the end, it's about restoring wellness. And you know what? And this is important because even if you were quote unquote not diagnosed with sleep apnea, because unfortunately, and we are working on this, right? The gender inequality, the sheer gender inequality in the diagnosis of sleep apnea. No 28 year old girl with a whopping open bite is going to be diagnosed with sleep apnea. But you know they're struggling because that's why they look the way they are and they feel the way they are. And they are three times more likely to be on an antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication. So we can, you know, we can, so, so there's so much uh, to do there. But you know what? If we think that everybody we treat uh, with sleep disorder breathing or just airway health during sleep is on the journey to wellness, I think we're on to something. That's one. The second one that I would, uh, I would, um, uh, you know, challenge, um, and not challenge, but to, to really you know, ask for collaboration with Sarush is there's so much of these technology that folks are developing that's one-to-one, -one, meaning you're looking at one thing and you're trying to answer one thing. What is really, really sexy, though, is if you take eight things, eight of them together, and make it a big thing, meaning, for example, uh, the platform that we're working on here, if we take what you have and we link it to diet and we link it to everything that whatever it is wearables that the patient's wearing and you you integrate it together because remember information data is not information so that's the other thing we have to keep in mind you can share data all you want data is not information but how do you transform that data into information so if I were to say for this tongue tie individual who's struggling at age 28, who is a South Asian individual, who's about to eat this meal, is going to hurt their sleep this much and hurt their activity level the next day, that's information. That's information. So right now, a lot of these things that we're doing are very univariate. You're looking at one group of information, which is great. If we can take that and incorporate it and integrate it with other lines and information, man, that, that really does change behavior and change what we do. So so we're getting there, and then we'll work on that together. But I think um, just to, because otherwise we'll, we'll be developing like 80,000 devices to look at 80,000 conditions. When when it comes to sleep and breathing, man, it's all, all of it is integrated. So um, cool stuff ahead, uh, cool stuff ahead. Really great. Um, I know we're getting low on time, but I do have a question. I think we all have patients that have maybe changed our life, our way of thinking. Um, just there's maybe a handful that have had like a really strong being one of our options. I want to see if any of you would share um, a certain case or patient that maybe changed your life or changed your way of thinking. We we have. I have one patient. Is he talking, Audrey? Yeah, I mean, I, I can, I can talk with you, Ken. I think we are out of time, but uh, I was thinking of Austin. I see. Who, who are you thinking of? I have my own brother. <laughs> my own brother. I mean, brother. Yeah. So I have a little brother who is uh, twelve years younger than me, and uh, who I raised in on my back. Uh, he moved to U.S. after I moved to U.S., and I was his guardian during his middle school and high school. So I'm like a little mom for him. And he has. Uh, he was like super duper healthy all the time. But uh, during growth spurt, he had a developed class three underbite with like a long chin, and I just became orthodontist in U.S. So. I placed the braces on him and I planned for orthognatic surgery. But then that time he had to go back to Korea. So I asked my close uh, orthodontist friend in Korea to finish his uh, surgical case. And I mean, I did a search. So he was one of the best surgeons in Korea. He received his orthognatic surgery. And, um, you know, those are typical underbite cases. You push the lower jaw back, but bring upper jaw forward a little bit. And his case turned out to be like perfect. My uh, friend Orsodan is even using his cases. So he's a ortho board presentation case. 
But then the later, my brother had to be uh, uh, in the hospitalized for several months uh, when uh, where he couldn't breathe during the military training in Korea. In, in Korea, you have to be uh, in the military, like a uh, mandatory for two years. And so he received a turbinectomy, septoplasty in army hospital, and he got better a little bit, but now he started snoring like a honk uh, ever since the surgery. Um, you can hear him from even another room. So um, now he, we, we found that he has a sleep apnea and now he's uh, wearing oral appliance to the current knee. But ever since I look at every surgical case is very, very differently. I mean, like airways, huge component uh, when we plan the jaw surgery. Um, yeah, it always happened to be your, your family member who hit you the most, right? Wow. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. That's, that's uh, it, when it's your own family member, it's it, it, it's something else. But and then you I, are I the wanted to... operator, <laughs> and then you that? yeah, you are the family member, and you are the one who planned all the surgery. You know, yeah. you like yeah. so, so so that's a that's a family that becomes a patient. But um, you know, there are patients like like this guy Austin who we treated together almost seven eight years ago, and I think it's the it's the patients who become your friends, um, that 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 really touch you. Um, because you realize that like, these are real people and we're really affecting their lives, you know? Um, and it just gives you like this, uh, like another humility for, for the field. Cause this is, the, cause this one patient that we worked on had so many challenges, uh, to go through, but, but he stuck with us there and, uh, you know, it's not easy to have these treatments here. He's saying that he had these treatments and, you know, um, how challenging it was and how long it took him to, you know, finally accept, uh, you know, the new way that he looks, but how grateful he is that he has a life worth living, you know? Um, wow. Think about that, right? Like, this like, case is all the Soroshi's job. You never give up. He give had up. every procedure. He had every, he had turbinate reduction, U triple P, MMA, hyoid suspension, palate expansion. Uh, until he finally got there. And I think that's the, that's one of the struggles that a lot of patients have is just one after another. And the lesson is to, you know, don't give up and, you know, be there for your patients because there is light at the end of the tunnel. That was amazing. This is all, I give all the credit to Dr. Zage. He, uh, you, Stanley did the surgery and you did the <laughs> ortho uh, and I held his hand across so. the way. Yeah, you'd never keep up. But that's amazing. That is absolutely fantastic. I know that we're running out of time and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, since we talked so much about research, I do want to ask a last question. Uh, and then uh, also, if you guys want to share anything about what's going on in your uh, you know, courses, research, anything that you guys would like um, to share with us that we could help with. Um, but anyways, the last question is, how do you collaborate when you do research together? Because many of us over here, we don't really know. We haven't really, you know, worked with a team or done research. Uh, There's so many people messaging right now saying they're so inspired and they want to help. But how do we do that? How do you work with the team? Uh, so it starts with an idea like you guys in this group. OK, and it's private conversations. Is this, is this project worth doing? Is it worth doing now? Is it worth doing later? Do we have the time, the resources? Who's gonna push it at which phase, okay? Um, what's the end goal? And is this uh, research uh, gonna be scalable, right? Is there, is there a long-term vision to kind of carry it through? Um, and then depending on you know, uh, whose interest it is, uh, it's been you know, primarily Audrey and I who are doing the data collection phases. Uh, so either Audrey will collect the data or my team at the Breathe Institute uh, will help with that phase. And um, we're stronger when we work together, whether it's, you know, advising each other on the study design or data analysis or even coming to publication. And we have very clear communication on who's leading the project. Having an idea is having an idea, but bringing it to fruition is challenging, takes a lot of push, especially when there's challenges from the IRB board. The IRB for the lip taping project asked us if it is safe to breathe through your nose. They asked us to demonstrate the safety of breathing through your nose without your mouth, okay? And they prohibited us from doing this on anyone less than 12 years of age, the, the initial phase of research. Can you believe that? Wow. Can you believe that? They said it's dangerous to try this on kids three to 12 years old. 
to see if they can breathe exclusively through the nose for, for 30 minutes. There's never been a study done on it before. So we finally got it approved. We gave up on that. Um, here we are for the data collection phase of it. Um, uh, let's, let's, let's do our best to really get what Stanley's talking about, about that, you know, grassroots data. Uh, it's almost harder to collect than, than in a Petri dish of a clinic like Audrey's clinic, right? Because Audrey can go and just knock it out and, sh and her data is super reliable. Like it's like reliable to a T. You can, you can swear by her data. But when you get it from the community, it's not as reliable and it's much more challenging for a test or something to analyze because there's much, 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 much more variability uh, in that data set. I'll let Audrey answer that and Stanley answer that as well. <laughs> but I think work with uh, Soroshi is the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay to collecting 1,000 patients, but uh, the Soroshi has the amazing uh, way of uh, analyzing data. And then, uh, yeah, it was amazing. I yeah, think it's yeah. the one, well, what's yeah. it? What's the, the one data that we had a two statisticians at UCLA and our, we couldn't find a conclusion. And so, Rishi, you just that, run. That was, was that Ferris or Bruxism? Which one was that? It was Bruxism paper, right? Bruxism paper. Bruxism so. paper. How easy is that? So, so Audrey's data showed that Bruxism, 90% of Bruxism is either, is either tonsil, tongue tie, or nasal obstruction. All right. And the data was like there. It was beautiful. It was gorgeous. I'm like, here you go. And the uh, statistician uh, is like weird uh, tables. And table. what was that? Yeah, that was the 100 data from UCLA pediatric, you know. Yeah, it's like, it's like all over the place, yeah. But we have like a mean, two a mathematician, like a statistician that we hire at UCLA. Yeah. And like our data, does is, it was basically useless. And then Soroshi was running with a special software, the, the statistics software. And the they software, yeah. The gold, so um, yeah, just and, uh, and, and we need Stanley to inspire us and show us the way and to be the dreamer who's going to tell us what we do and guide us and inspire us. Uh, I was on, you know, I was in vacation in Hawaii with my family. I got to share this last bit, if you don't mind. All right. And I was like, life is, it was 4th of July. Uh, we were, we were in the pool. I mean, the weather was perfect. And I'm like, oh, could life be any better? <laughs> and we were there in Maui. I'm coming down the slide and I bump into Stanley Lou randomly on vacation in the pool. I cannot tell you my joy, my inspiration. I was screaming. I was yelling. I think he was there with somebody. I was like, this is the best day of my life just to be around you and just to be inspired by you a little bit. Uh, it's been so great to be able to be in this forum with you guys and to be inspired. I'm going to remember this, that I came on Airway Circle and Stanley Lou said, we need to go grassroots and we need to get the community to give in the data. That's what he said. That's what the Stan the Man said, right? That was phase one. And phase two, he said, we have to come up with machine learning to diagnose tongue ties. These are hard things to do, guys. All right. These are hard things to do. But since Stanley, professor of sleep apnea, and you know, put your whole credential there at Stanford is is demanding this of us. Uh, we have no choice, Audrey, right? But to but to get our hands dirty, roll up our sleeves, right? And we'll get it done for you, sir. All right. And we'll we'll we're always your your students. Um, and Whatever you know, all the memory of, of our ultimate teacher, Dr. Gimeno, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. And that is a, the weirdest coincidence that he happened to be in Hawaii in the same pool, same water slide, like. You know, that you it was unbelievable. It makes no sense at all. But you know, <laughs> I've done. I I can't tell you. Like I was in a random airport lounge and in, in Scottsdale, and freaking like Michael Wa shows up. You know, like my fellows are like <laughs> your, ghosts. your fellows are everywhere. Like, <laughs> have you heard the saying? Souls travel together. I have not, uh -huh. but now I believe it. I believe it one thousand percent. But, but to be fair, I did see Max and your wife before I saw you. I was like, man, they look so familiar. Whoa, and there's so <laughs> And then it's over. And it's, uh, uh, it's, so you know, it's meant to be. And, and uh, no, I, I, you know, I, I look, I, I think, you know, Renata and Nicole bring the group together. Um, I, I think I, I think things you'll consistently hear from myself and Audrey and Saroosh are things we're actually working on now. We, we, we're not telling you things we were working on eight years ago. 
and then we really would like all of your collective help. And, and I, I think it's because I think it, it hurts me a little bit to see a binder that is worth so much to wait for 40 years, but that back then they did, did not have Zoom and they did not have all this stuff that we have. Uh, we should not wait 40 years to make a difference. So so um, it, it, it really is a collective effort. Um, I, I think there is value in democratization of data. I think data is not information, but if that makes a change, though, it really is. And so um, I think, Saroosh, the stuff that you're working on, it will give us a guideline, right? Because otherwise we don't, quite, quite frankly, we don't know what we're going to send in. But once you are at a stage where you're like, these are the valuable images and videos and whatever that's that's important, when we combine that with with uh, you know our wearables and our diet and our lifestyle uh, and everything that we do, um, we really will make a change. So so um, you know um, lead the way, give us some guidelines, Thank you for your vision. yeah, and then and we put this thing in together. Um, and, Beautiful. um, you know, it really should not take 40 years to, no. to, 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 uh, you know, for, for on our path to wellness. Um, and then, so thank you both. Thank you. And Audrey yeah. and, and, um, thank you team. And yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it's been a, a real, real really pleasure. pumps us up, doesn't it? To, to have these people hang out with us on Friday night. Thank you guys for what you do. It's not. It's yeah, how much did you pay them, Renata? How much you pay these people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Guys, sure. it is not. Is it? It is not. Even if they say it's easy, what they do is not easy. It takes mm. so much work. It takes so much effort. It takes so much foresight uh, to get everyone together and bring the guys to you. I hope you guys know how lucky you are to be part of this group, and we're so grateful to you guys as leaders of the community uh, for pushing this forward. So, thank you so much Thanks. for uh, inviting us here. I hope we have the opportunity to come back together again, uh, Audrey and Stanley, um, hopefully with uh, more research to share with you guys, more knowledge, more directions, uh, and a very bright future ahead. I want to say one last thing, yeah. because the three Thank of you. you are heroes to so many of us, really. A lot of us really look up to you, and um, I just want to thank you all so much, because I know you are so busy traveling here there i even know you guys are all over the place spreading this message and the work you do is so appreciated and so i hope you can have a really relaxing weekend you stayed so late on a friday night speaking with all of us and just going to this weekend knowing how appreciated you are by so many people okay so thank you and with everything that we talked tonight to help this grow even more Look on uh, Facebook for your state chapters. Now, Aries Circle is putting out state chapters so you can grow your local states. Uh, and with that, we started the fireside chat with Stanley um, a couple weeks ago. We were in New York to try also raise awareness to women's sleep issues and whatever else we need to do to, uh, you know, grow this field. So stay tuned, Aries Circle for professionals and then your state um, those are rolling out slowly, but we need everybody. We need your help. You know, we can't do any of this alone. So thank you guys so much for being here. We're so appreciative of you. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for inviting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool.